So ever since, and to carry on with that theme uh, that, um, uh, that has been so greatly discussed, the building itself, so ever since the arrival of the Dublin exhibition to Leinster Lawn in 1853, in all of its transparent magnificence, as seen here on the lid of this lacquer papier-mâché box, the Dublin exhibition building uh, has attracted the attention of art historians and interested parties for its striking domed barrel vaulted halls, totaling five in number, and its colourful interior, which, as we heard last night, pretty much unique, uh, having its fine arts hall. There are all sorts of questions raised or that might be asked about it, Mm. And while I'm concentrating on the souvenirs and the memorabilia that take home today, we might think first and foremost as to why the architect John Benson opted uh, for this unusual form and plan. And instead of uh, mapping, uh, you know, as he could have, straight onto the London Great Exhibition to keep it rectangular uh, within the area of the lawn. And Benson, on the drawing, uh, it is published, so he said, it will be seen at a glance that this plan every available piece of ground on the premises of the Royal Dublin Society was occupied by the exhibition building, a circumstance which will account for the irregularity of outline. A uh, principal factor must have been the site constriction, as we've heard, and not easy to slot a building into this contained space, as well as connecting to the existing 18th century buildings behind of Society House, as Benson had previously done uh, at the Corn Exchange in Cork in the industrial exhibition buildings, as we've seen. Uh, the experience of change of tempo, therefore, to the visitor through, you know, ushered through the halls, the era of modernity of steam and steel towards the 18th century society house, perhaps a one-way system in place from the west side of Marion Square, exiting onto Dawson Street. And the front entrance, uh, sorry, here, uh, which we've also seen, uh, indeed, um, that uh, was the west side of Marion Square, but this was the image that endured. And uh, pretty much as we're beginning to ascertain, much of this was about the staging. And quoting the, the uh, Illustrated Dublin exhibition catalogue, presenting, it said, a front to Marion Square of 300 feet. And actually this is quite an interesting take in terms of an aerial view on that, uh, there, where is that connection to society house, you may ask. But essentially, it's about that presence, the eastern termination of the central hall, uh, which was described as being 100 feet in height and covered by a semicircular roof trellis of a span of 100 feet. So the setting, all important. And a photograph by Tennyson of 1853, uh, as we've seen, and we saw it also last night remarkably, shows the drama of the main hall a double height space filled with remarkable goods from around the world. And as we say, 100 feet high, equivalent to the great cathedrals uh, of Paris was one of the uh, associated notions. And paired here with a hand-tinted postcard from 1810, depicting the aftermath, uh, the view from Leinster on out, the view, the rear of uh, Prince Consort, the rear view of uh, the sculpture by Foley, uh, 1868, and the void in this image is as emphatic as the solid it replaced with the new and the impression of the new art gallery to the south, the legacy of, uh, of William Dargan, who was our financier and sponsor. And the expressive portrait of Dargan, as we've seen in different guises, uh, by Catterton, Stephen Catterton, 1862, from the National Gallery, conveys a diffident nature. Dargan was a visionary. Uh, he had apprenticed under Thomas Telford. He had experienced those hard times of Dickens in building English infrastructure very much. This this is his training ground, the roads, the canals, the railways. So he appreciated hard labor and intensive building. But there were very few railway contracts in Ireland at the time, certainly from the 1830s, Dublin and Belfast Junction Railway, Dublin to Kingston Line, which had its own engineering feat of the great embankment across Bhutan Marsh. But he guaranteed, as we've heard, underwrote the exhibition at his own expense, noted in the RDS minutes. So this affirmation of national self-confidence in that period of post-famine growth. The exhibition hall was conjured up in various images and the opening, uh, as we've seen, dedicated on this side to Dargan. But it's that repetition of these se several published images in lithograph form or in painted image, 
of this entrance and front facade from close quarters, suggesting very close coordination by the society organisers. Uh, and that committee, we've heard the various notables, Knight of Kerry, for example, Lord Plunkett, all present in terms of that great celebratory opening day. Uh, and the London exhibition, similarly led by the Prince Consort and the team. So celebration at the heart of this idea. And um, the Dublin exhibition then, uh, as with, Dub with London, has its memorial role from its inception and its reception. And the notion of taking that away uh, in terms of the box such as this to encapsulate modernity of empire, um, a positive veneer of this temple of both art and industry, sharing character representation from London uh, uh, and from the, uh, you know, also setting both and drawing on this new industrial age, if you like, rising uh, and improving of industrial standards, bringing novel designs such as this object, state-of-the-art technologies and material and taste being articulated from London, manufactured in this case from Birmingham, uh, which was the great manufacturing centre, bringing mechanisation, new materials such as, uh, in this case, papier-mâché, uh, made into this new form format to Dublin. And here, advertising uh, the image constant present, in this case, uh, advertising the sale of piano fortes, which could be bespoke, uh, brought, uh, bought on demand. So there are certain differences uh, alluded to, as we heard in last night's talk, within Dublin, the main hall had the armorial bearings, the captains of industry, ecclesiastics, educational academies, but most importantly was the reference to cities of empire, the nation consuls in Dublin, those celebrated from Japan to Belgium to Malta, um, and that connected nationhood as a symbolism. symbolism. Equally noted, and we've heard about the great Expositor, uh, which you know published weekly on site, made note of this. The interior color coded, as we've also heard in terms of Owen Jones, but that armorial connection to countries recognizing the capabilities of Ireland. David Dixon, as we know, has argued also closely for the significance of Dublin Corporation in connection with the Dublin Society carefully planning the situation of the event and its aftermath. So that clear anxiety to distinguish itself in terms of Dublin. Yet, the exhibition hall was the container for this, uh, this vessel, for this, this box, the memorabilia. It's a Japan lacquer speciality box made by makers Jennings and Betteridge from 1853. It has the image, as we've heard or, or note, of the Dublin exhibition on its lid. It's a reverse glass technique. In fact, close-up detail, you can see that they slightly missed the number three is actually reversed when you look up close. We can see it in the exhibition. Um, but an overt impression of grandeur and monumentality, but linked also to um, the great presence of that London exhibition. Uh, 1851 is on this side. So this is the Jennings and Betteridge, uh, a similar take on this, uh, and obviously the first impression uh, of a reverse glass image set into a letter folder. Uh, and indeed, uh, for the project itself, uh, over six million visitors we heard visited the uh, greatest imperial project of the mid-19th century. And Olivia Horsfall Turner has reminded us in her recent book that Owen Jones, uh, about Owen Jones and the V&A, that this was almost a third of the national population visiting, uh, which was 27 million. So they had, as we you know, were establishing this extraordinary presence, this novelty. And the landscaping essential in both of these draw drawings, these captured illustrations, uh, this staging, the ecological solution in terms of Joseph Paxton. He incorporates a great elm tree inside the Crystal Palace. Uh, Benson uses the surrounding uh, lawn, which is also captured in this image. So to the, the defiance of traditional architecture, the great feat of mid-19th mid century engineering represented, not quite stylized yet, uh, or capturing the, the, where its direction is, as um, Andrew has pointed to, uh, perhaps something or, uh, Turkish oriental, those baths within that great dome, but depicted in terms of small objects and these miniatures. Other ephemera, we've noted already, uh, the great uh, ticket, admin the, the, those admission, uh, London was five shillings dropped to one, uh, and as Cora mentioned, uh, the Dublin, uh, this notion of being reusable, that was also something in advance, uh, and no apparent social distinction 
the entire exhibition was open to all classes. Uh, women, uh, interestingly, in Dublin outnumbered the male visitors by two to one. So therefore, where does that situate us in terms of the, co the, com the commercial opportunities, the consumer, uh, the possibility of buying the wares in the exhibition came via advertisements, displays, and sale catalogues, and of course, the great expositor. Uh, souvenir makers perfected the art of serial production to supply the great exhibitions both in London and followed uh, in Dublin. These were sources for expanding markets, and the growing middle classes in the middle, mid 19th century in Dublin put shopping uh, for, in the forefront as a pastime. Uh, indeed, and there's a number of uh, papers a little later today, the memory of the famine close at hand, and there were advertisements for discounts for those buying uh, and shopping to give uh, charitable do donations of food and clothing. And St. Peter's Market in the Rotunda at Sackville Street uh, was a place where you could deposit uh, such donations. McSweeney's uh, Delaney and Company, the new and palatial market, open, its opening coincided with the great exhibition. And uh, Stephanie Raines, who's speaking later, has drawn attention to this notion of the monster store. Um, windows and five right across onto Sackville Street, full of objects from the exhibition uh, on its opening day. Andrews uh, of uh, the corner of Dane Street held Jensen and Benner's tea caddies, Grafton Street, eclipsing the other streets uh, in terms of holding, uh, you know, what elements of market, bookshops, treasures from the exhibition, Hodges and Smith, 104 Grafton Street, Utzman and Grafton Street. Arthur Jones also had for sale the duality of objects. You could buy on one hand, or he, he was presenting the bog oak sculpture uh, on one side of his shop at 90 Grafton Street, and on the other side, you could also take home a papier-mâché box, or indeed a tray of notes. So objects for the discerning shopper. And the elite of Dublin, uh, as Katie Milligan has emphasized in James Fraser's guidebook, was uh, it was a fashionable street. The elite would be found in, in Grafton Street. The principal shops uh, are, are notable. Spacious squares, while Dublin paucity of its steeples entitles it to rank as second city of empire. So there's a notable shift in emphasis in the narrative uh, towards this prosperity, uh, indeed a growing nationalism within the, the, the liturgy, uh, the literature. Um, and Emily Mark Fitzgerald in her new book on, or her recent book on the famine relief in Dublin, the, these houses were between 1844 and 49, the, uh, both Richmond uh, and uh, Portobello full to capacity. So emigration through uh, the city from the, the train lines facilitated steam package of Dargan's associations. Recovery, though, on the other side, was recorded, and Roy Foster also written much about this notion of the complacent middle classes. Upwardly mobile generation, so what are they buying? What are they going to do? Um, indeed, back in, inside the hall, exhibition details of objects. The skilled tradesman would earn around 30 shillings a week, while a man in the professions of law and medicine could earn considerably more. So these new middle classes keen to emulate uh, London taste. And Dickens last, of course, we should have mentioned him, uh, he visited Dublin 1858. He, he was more happy, he said, in the Coombe where the rags were fluttering. Uh, he was struck by these new suburbs. But his old curiosity shop, uh, which gripped Dubliners, that notion of the, uh, the ending, and uh, um, in fact that uh, allegedly uh, Oak Daniel O'Connell threw the copy uh, of, of uh, hearing the tale of in frustration how Dickens had killed off his heroine Nell. But essentially, wearing the Irish tweed, uh, Dickens a fan and supporter. But the old curiosity shop itself, interestingly, in terms of old world commerce, uh, gathered paper, which was recycled uh, into papier-mâché. So it was part of that trade. Um, essentially, then, in terms of this uh, box itself and these new objects, new methods of display, uh, new methods of manufacture, uh, in fact, in terms of papier-mâché, over 120 sheets of compressed paper could uh, you know, be, were used as crushed together uh, and constrained into these different forms with the maker's mark on the bottom noted uh, inside either a silk in terms of the uh, interior of a writing desk, a portable uh, detail or indeed tea caddies and these 
where various containers, silk lined or lined with bays, Jennings and Betteridge operated between 1850 and 1867, successfully developing industrial papier mache production, employing artists from Birmingham School of Design, London School of Design, to create these decorative yet functional uh, objects which had been japanned or lacquered. Uh, Henry Clay was the person who painted the painted and these in 1811, uh, shellac and a linseed, very toxic, ultimately uh, heated to temperatures of 200 degrees or more. Other methods were bringing and the painting of the shell, the abalone or uh, mother of pearl. So quite intricate work. And this, uh, while they went in for larger uh, uh, and different kinds of, uh, you know, different adjustments in terms of reverse glass or painting of shellac detailing, the scale of their objects, you know, were what was apparent in the exhibition. These large sofas made of papier-mâché, uh, one these kind of fire screens, and indeed Aaron Jenner's of Jenner's and Be Be uh, Betteridge made a visit to Ireland in 1849, uh, reco recording uh, not least the, a view of the four courts, but also these uh, the canals from uh, and the lake of lakes of Killarney, very much part of that exhibition. Uh, these were uh, gilded. Uh, fans and fire screens prominent uh, because of that visit from, from Queen Victoria who had made, uh, the, made her impression in that area in terms of tourism and the lakes of Killarney at the centre. So just to, uh, to conclude essentially on in terms of materiality technologies, Spruill um, in the Irish Industrial Exhibitions commented that papier-mâché goods have late become considerable important articles of utility. Uh, the facility of which the substance can be moulded into any required shape and the great extent to which it admits ornamentation. But there it is, that's where the debate would rage. And in fact, the battle of ornament uh, was already almost lost for them. There was a great criticism uh, from the London exhibition, which tails over into Dublin, in terms of businesses making such objects of papier-mâché, overtaken very quickly by electrotype industry, that of cellulose. And um, indeed, uh, as we heard last night, John Crace, uh, or examples like John Crace furniture makers, worked alongside Pugin in London to present real furniture. And one of the great Brummigan words of counterfeit makes reference to uh, this notion of something that's not real. So authenticity being championed later, as we also heard last night uh, by John Ruskin. Um, so in a last gasp, Jennings and Betters, uh, begin to make very bespoke uh, details and decorations. So they decorated the panels on the interior of uh, the Viceroy of Egypt uh, ship. They were making designs in papier-mâché. They took out a, um, a shop uh, front in New York for the rival New York exhibition. But ultimately, the, uh, the, 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 the chairs uh, the making of utilitarian furniture, the rival was incoming, and that was um, the firm of Thone, uh, where they could make up to a thousand simple chairs of bentwood uh, per week. And essentially, these were the firm's key design principle, as opposed to that of Benin's, uh, of Jenner and Betteridge. Uh, Thone were able to, able to increase production to 10,000 chairs per year. Uh, and so when those generation, for example, in Ranala, Rath Mines were looking for a table and six chairs to furnish their new houses. Uh, the the papier-mâché were a rarefied object. So in fact, therein lay the difficulty and the company ultimately went out of business in 1868. Also as a backdrop, and as we noted, Owen Jones, uh, in terms of the Dublin exhibition, and we mentioned the bathhouses, Dargan undertook other aspects of importance uh, to find a solution. Uh, there were fountains running within the, uh, the, the, within the exhibition, and that notion of providing clean water to the suburbs was essential. So he builds new reservoirs at Stillorgan and Vartry, and it was those that filled the bathhouses at, uh, here in College Green and in, or in Leinster uh, Street and uh, in um, also Bray, the Vartry Reservoir. Owen Jones promised a more attentive study. He said that to provide design students 
fills with an ever-gushing fountain in place of a half-filled stagnant reservoir. And this was a jibe at the counterfeit. The shortcomings of British manufacture from this point uh, was made, made clear. Inexpensive furniture was much more desired. And essentially, market forces expanded in a different direction, not uh, towards utility, not luxury. So the key then of Jones, and this rather wonderful image is of, from David Roberts, a painting of the interior from Hyde Park of the exhibition. The ephemera from London was in another uh, realm, essentially bolder, uh, much more magnitude of, of uh, many more have survived. There were many more type of, uh, of ephemera, of memorabilia that, that was available. Thimbles, clay pipes, we've seen boxes, needlework, and other details. Then that was present in Dublin, rosettes, paper. Um, so to conclude with that, and there was the last of the great uh, Benin and Gen Jennings and better chairs, I'm getting it all mixed up, and just to show you the bentwood on the side that really overtook uh, their more bespoke luxury objects. So in terms of the last point, um, uh, the medals themselves, uh, Dargan was uh, committed to coinage uh, and commemorated by um, the, the Woodhouse, William Woodhouse family, also Birmingham, Birmingham Associations. Um, and his father, too, trained in the making of metal buttons. That equally was a practice that uh, tailed off. So the coinage himself and his son went invested in, and this, uh, the obverse, you see the head right, uh, Dargan with on his neck, it says Woodhouse, and uh, also reference back to our image from the society lawn with some of those details. It's corresponding reference point, of course, again, linking to Crystal Palace, but also also making reference to uh, its competing, its rival in uh, New York. Uh, coinage from London and New York depicted here with all of their bold details uh, laid out. How many, how much, how long. And essentially the takeaway, the immediate aftermath was, and this is the last just to say, uh, of course those universal expositions continued. Uh, Manchester was of course the great legacy in terms of art. His construction, his, his p pushing for, I suppose, and leading towards the uh, gallery of art, uh, very much for Dargan. But lastly, he himself, uh, the construction of all those great leading railway lines of water source to Dublin, he declined the knighthood, uh, a modest man to the very end. But essentially, his house at Mount Anvil on the prow of the hill uh, at the Deer Park, Queen Victoria came to visit. They planted a sequoia together. So there was quite a strong sense of connection. Uh, and in, uh, I think, quite uh, many eyebrows raised at this, but also uh, to note that uh, he, his office was the top floor of this, uh, of the tower. Over the bay, he could survey not least his exhibition room, but the great railway that he was building. Haji Bay's, I brought this at the end. There was one other last slide to lead to the next phase and next panels. Um, the diversity of design w wasn't, that didn't go unnoticed. And of course, not least the next uh, international exhibitions. Cork was one of the leaders of that. And a Christmas treat always in our house, so some good things survive, uh, was the Turkish delight. And they were the one, one group of Armenians who came to Cork in 1902 and put this into production, and it is still going. So some, some things last. So thank you uh, for your attention today, and uh, I'll leave it there.